Yeah, you know, David, I um, I have four monitors as well. I do uh, my laptop, and then I've got three spanned across, and it's worked out really great. Except um, I did a webinar on Tuesday, and I was the main presenter instead of having Ray run it, and so I was presenting my screen, and then everybody else was like taking keyboard control from me. Um, and when I put the PowerPoint on full, it covered everybody's faces. So then I had to put the faces off to the side and, um, but then I was presenting. So well, I, when I realized I couldn't look you guys in the eye. I couldn't drag it back over and I had to just stare at my camera. I, I haven't have watched the video. Yet, I think you, you use your uh, monitors, those three, and you have, well, you have an NVIDIA card in there? Uh, no, I, uh, I mean, yeah, actually I do. My laptop's got an NVIDIA card in it and then my, uh, my docking station has one as well. Does it make those one monitor? Does it span those to make them one monitor, essentially? Uh, no, uh, I don't know if I can do that or not. I, okay. I can't. That, that's a negative. It sounds like a positive, but it turns out to be a negative. And if you have actually three separate monitors uh, in Windows, just put some next to each other, then when you do a PowerPoint or maximize something, it'll just go to one monitor or two monitors. But if you have them spanned as they're considered as one monitor, then when you maximize something or run something full screen, it goes across them all. And that's a negative in, in your presentation case there. So anyway, just keep, I changed mine to be in one mode where it was a negative for webinars and and, and videos, uh, meetings like this. And I put it back to the individual. So you may have an ability like that. Yeah, I mean, it was one of, it, well, and it was one of those things that like, had I not been sharing my screen into the audience like when it all went down i probably could have fixed it easy enough and just like taken my powerpoint drag that up to another monitor you know because it's it's I, I need to have the faces sitting right underneath my keyboard so it looks like i'm or my camera so it looks like it right so it looks eye. like you're looking in the right spot not right not too far away yep i know my my camera is integrated into my laptop which is the smallest screen i have all my dashboards over here so sometimes it seems like i'm not looking but I am. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Smith. Good morning. Morning. I don't see David. I hear David. Hmm. I'm around somewhere. Let me see here. Do you guys no no but do you guys see me? Yeah, you guys are the actually speaker. actually no, I don't see see you. Oh. So well, maybe the fine. webcam's not on? Yeah. The, um, the there's a there's a button in go to meeting up there. See if you. Uh, there it is. I thought I was on. Uh, let's see. Give me one second. I thought that splash screen was supposed to be gone. There it goes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. Oh man! All right. I need to get X split. Oh, I now I disappeared again, but it should come back. Up oh, there we go. Boom! All right, that should be locked and loaded now. Mm -hmm. Good. The um. You know, we already have people on, so people that haven't seen an unplugged session before may think that, wow, this is interesting. I get to see these guys in the raw. They're just chatting about their microphones and cameras. Well. And that's exactly that's exactly why it's called unplugged. So uh, you get to you get to see us in the raw, and uh, we intentionally have some small talk, coffee chat, water chat, water cooler chat for the first few minutes here, until we have everyone join us. In this case, 15 minutes after the hour or so, and then we'll get a little bit more formal, but you'll get to know us a little bit more today. Um, we're still waiting on Chris Walker to join us, too. Sounds good. Good morning. I got my uh, old original Liquidware Labs 09 hat handy nice. on my desk here. Got to have that handy. I, I won't wear it for the, there's no sun in here right now, so <laughs> don't uh, need to put it on, but. <laughs> Got my 09, 09 hat. Excellent. I like that. That's a that's that's a limited run though, right? That's a there limited you? run. Yeah. There's, right. uh, there's, there's no more of those unless you look on eBay. <laughs> I, I uh, yeah, and then on the back it's got the little. Uh, well, what's the story behind that? What's the uh, was that was that from 2009? Uh, well, no, actually it's not. Since we started in 2009, it was uh, when uh, when Ackerberg got these run for the company, he thought let's go to racing theme probably because some of my cars and then he um put I never got on one of those kind of... I never got one it wasn't special oh uh, no for the startup year yeah yeah Jason There's I'll Chris look at if I've got a sample in my uh in my office when we get back to the office at some point in time oh that'd be great 
Uh, Chris Walker with his uh, Go Dogs cap on. Chris Walker's coming to us from God's country, where I went to school out in Athens, Georgia. <laughs> Athens, Georgia. Yeah. Bad thing is I'm a tech fan, but my wife, my money, and my daughter all go to Georgia, so, so <laughs> been converted. The house divided. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I got 15 TVs. The Georgia Georgia Tech game is crazy, and. Uh, Last time Tech beat Georgia, my wife didn't speak to me for about two weeks. So, yep, it's a little heated around here. It's 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 a local rivalry in the state, but they're not even in the same conference, right? Georgia's in the yeah, SEC, okay. and Tech is in the A ACC. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. College football is bigger than. Uh, Regular football, if you watch the Falcons down here, the college football is a lot more uh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> that game's coming up this month if it's on the regular schedule sometime around right after Thanksgiving, right? Saturday yeah. after Thanksgiving yep. usually, yeah. Yep, yep. So excited about that. I'm not sure. My mo mother-in-law has asked me today what we're doing for Thanksgiving. Are anybody getting together? My parents have called off their event. Oh, we're, we're getting together. Are you? No. Yep. No, not us. We're... We're staying in lockdown. Yep. Same here. Need to get off. Need to get her to get a turkey to, order, though. I still need to find out on that first unplugged event. I had on my mask and my gloves and, you know, all COVID ready. Mm -hmm. And I uh, took my mask off and somebody put on the chat, Chris, put your mask back on. But, hmm, I need to find it. I need to track that down, find out who said that. I'm betting a Tom Miller uh, kind of comment. Sounds like that. Yep. I did, might have been Jason. I'm not sure. It might have been Jason. It might have been. Logging yeah. on from my other PC. <laughs> yeah, his, <laughs> his background, his stage name. <laughs> How do I get some of those liquid wear of the gray shirts like Torian has? This, it's all for show. Look at this. We, we got him. Go to the store. Uh, Got them in the store. online store. You go online and just uh, order how many you need. Send them to your house, right? Just click your. Yep. Okay. That's it. Yeah. This, I looked for one because he was talking about it yesterday, and I looked for mine. I couldn't find it, so. And yeah, on that point, I actually uh, worked with Ray yesterday. I uh, I went to the store and, and put together a grab bag of some of our cooler stuff for one of our new partners here in Colorado. Um, that's what it's there for. That's what it's there for. I'm glad to We really here. do, man. I mean, I've been at a lot of places. I think I, I, I love our swag. A I cool like all, store. I like all our stuff. A cool online store. Thanks, Ray. No problem. Ray, are the uh, little drones still up there? Uh, they are, if you, if you can't access them, let me know. Um, you might need a separate login for that. Um, that's not just part of our general giveaways, but yeah, we have some still. Yeah, I've got one. Actually, I'll go dig it up here in a minute. It's pretty cool. Nice. You fly it from your phone. Next time you'll have to do the unplug with the camera from that, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. I webcast for my, uh, for my little drone there. Fly yeah. around does it house. have a camera on it? It does. It does. It's, a, yeah. it's like a selfie drone. Oh yeah. my goodness! Yeah, yeah. I'll be emailing you after this. It's pretty oh. cool. I mean, it's it's about that big. It's it's tiny. Yeah, it's about yeah. the size of an iPhone. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. One guy at a, a one of the stores said, "Oh, you attach your iPhone to this, and then you it it kind of flies." It's like I'm not attaching my phone to that thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. So, yeah. We should write a book of all the stuff that we've seen at uh, like trade shows. Um, I had this laser keyboard that, you know, basically projected a keyboard on the mm -hmm. thing, and we, we would use them as giveaways. Um, and this guy came up, and he kept looking at the ceiling and looking at the ceiling, trying to figure out where that keyboard was coming from. He thought it was being projected from, off the ceiling. But it's just this little bitty box sitting on the right, sitting right there. That's Sky pretty awesome. awesome. Yeah. yeah. The key, that keyboard, if anybody ever had them, those things were awesome. They worked we, great. We had some. We gave some away. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, those were those were fun. Those were fun. I, my fingers would get a little sore after a while using it, though. Yeah, well, I'd use it like with my phone <laughs> when I'd be on the road. Mm -hmm. So I could type out I could type out a long email. It's a lot easier than using your thumbs. So it come in yeah. handy just to Bluetooth connect it to my phone um, when I was on the road and didn't have to take out my laptop for a long email. Yeah, yeah, worked pretty good. Excellent. So we're almost at quarter past the hour. 
Um, maybe before we get to that point, we should kind of do a little quick uh, go around, introduce everybody. But before we do that, just for anybody that's joined us since then, we are technically still pre-session as it goes here. What we like to do is start off about 15 minutes before the scheduled start time for the event, which is actually a quarter past the hour for this event, um, but just something to go out and, and have a little casual talk, um, invite people to kind of to come along and, uh, and get to know us a little bit better. So before uh, we get to that quarter past the hour, we'll go ahead around and introduce ourselves. I'm Ray Swanson. I'm the director of marketing here at Liquidware. So I'm kind of the man behind the curtain that's going to uh, help keep things moving and flowing for this session. Um, why don't we go ahead and give it to Jason Smith, who's going to be our moderator today. Thanks, Ray. I'm Jason Smith. I am. Uh, I lead product marketing management over at Liquidware with a with a bit of a technical spin, so not just pure marketing. And I've uh, been here since the first year, 2009. We'll talk a little bit about when we got started here in a little bit. <clears throat> Michael Torian. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Mike Torian. I am a uh, field sales engineer out of Denver, Colorado. Um, I've been here about two years. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to probably talk about some pretty cool stuff that we're doing with Stratosphere for those of you that haven't seen us in, in a while and some of the cool stuff that we can do from, from work from home and, and to facilitate migrations and really anything that anybody wants to hear about. And as Jason was saying, this is a, an open forum. So if you've got questions, get them in the chat and hopefully we'll get to them. David Benneman. Hey, I'm David Benneman. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Liquidware. And um, I'm here today uh, to participate in the Stratosphere uh, Q&A. So anything you have, whether it's related to uh, Liquidware or Stratosphere, I'd be more than happy to have a chat with you around the table here. Chris Sunny Walker. 50, Sunny and 51 yeah. in Chicago, by the way. Just to... <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, hey, I just want to point out, you know, we were talking about those little uh, those little keyboards a minute ago, and Tony uh, piped in and said he still has one of those and uses to mess with people. And you know what? I bring that up mostly for this point that today's session is really about interaction. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear your comments about the things that we're talking about. We want to be able to move through this and 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 get your feedback on this. Um, even if you have a question or a comment for us, if you want. Uh, ask that question or comment via the question or comment uh, uh, question or chat window. Sorry, any of those will do. I'll reach back out to you, and if you want, we will unmute you and make you part of the conversation and add you to join in. So um, that that's something great to have there. Uh, Tony actually just asked now, is it being recorded? Um, yes, it is totally being recorded. You don't have to type everything out. Um, we post the recording normally within about a day or so. It takes us to, to get it up into our archive. Um, so normally by tomorrow, we'll have it up. But the archive that we put these uh, Unplug sessions and since they are kind of a little uh, loosey-goosey free-flowing type uh, session is we put them in our community site so if you haven't gone to community at liquid uh, community.liquidware.com um, you can find links to the recordings from the unplug sessions there it's a great place for you to go and uh, interact with other experts and, and that's really what the community is about is this kind of interaction back and forth um, you can interact with experts like we have here uh, and also our users and and partners and, and anyone else who is out there using our products and offering solutions up. So if you haven't checked out uh, our community yet, please check that out. It's a great resource for you. Thanks, so Ryan. Having said that, we're at the quarter past the hour. Jason, you want to kind of... One more. One more introduction, Chris Walker. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. I'm sitting on, sitting on the end down here, you know, just being quiet. Yep. Uh, Chris Walker and everybody out here knows I'm a really quiet guy too, so. Um, Chris Walker, Field SC. Um, Athens, Georgia, home of the Bulldogs. Um, basically, I, I help out a lot with Stratosphere Profile Uni um, and uh, kind of specialize in the Stratosphere solutions and helping our customers you know, really solve problems. This COVID stuff has driven a lot of our customers nuts, and I've used Stratosphere to save a lot of large hospitals and banks, keep, help keeping them up and running. It's uh, been quite interesting this year, and I haven't had to shave in quite a while, so it's been even better. Thanks, Chris. Um, so if you're just joining us, and I see we see the numbers go up, so we've doubled our attendance in the last few minutes, and it, you're, you're not late, you are right on time. We get a soft start to these unplugged sessions, so you get to know us if you're in early, you get to see us 
in a more candid form and we stay candid throughout. So this, un, these unplugged sessions are, as Ray said, are as much about you as they are about uh, us letting you know what we have been up to lately. So submit your questions to the chat window. We'll get to those. If you prefer, we'll let you ask that question live. And even if you'd like, we may even continue to make you part of the panel. So we love to hear from uh, people out there that have a lot of experience in the industry or those that want to know more about the industry. Maybe you've just been dropped a desktop project and uh, you're looking for some assistance in that area. Or maybe you're a long time, uh, long time listener, first time caller, and you um, you want to add to the discussion. So we'd be glad to have have you participate either way. Uh, and if you just want to ask what the weather's like in Atlanta, that's fine too. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. We'll recap what the session's about. So uh, we started doing these unplugged sessions uh, at the start of the lockdown. And not that we're still in lockdown, some areas are and some aren't, but we don't get to see everybody at trade shows anymore, uh, at industry events, at conferences. And so this uh, un Liquidware Unplugged was um, conceived to be able to take up the slack in that area, to, to, to stay in touch with the community. And today's topic, we, we, we keep those loose. You're not going to see a long PowerPoint presentation today if you haven't seen one of these. Today's topic is about Stratosphere. It's one of our flagship products. That product has been in the liquid wear arsenal since the first year, which was 2009. David's, David's cap there we showed earlier, 2009 was the year that liquid wear was, was uh, started. But that product, that solution, goes back even further than, than, than that. Um, David and the, the founders of Liquid Wear got together and wanted to start a company that would ease this transition to the next desktop. In this case, they had in mind virtual desktops. Seeing the sprawl and the rapid adoption of server virtualization and knew that the tide was gonna come for the right use cases in virtual desktop adoption. So how do you get customers and partners to, to seamlessly onboard users? Um, you needed a solution that could assess desktops and know what those desktops were performing like. Are they meeting your expectations? Is that desktop better than the old desktop? Is the monitoring that you're doing sufficient because now you're gonna to go to a virtual desktop, you're not gonna be able to see the infrastructure right in front of you like a physical desktop, so you need monitoring at all the points along the way. All those integral points that start to um, make up your virtual desktop infrastructure, VDI, by the way, we own VDI.com, and, and uh, we have a community based around VDI.com. Uh, you see it on Twitter from time to time. But we have been in there since the very beginning where VMware had VMware Horizon brought to market, and then Citrix that same year was bringing Zen Desktop to market with the, uh, with the acquisition of Zen. So we've been partners with them all the way along. Um, but Stratosphere was the flagship as the company got started. Profile Unity came into play that same year, just a few months later. That was how I came into the company. Uh, we, we all joined that same year and then and if you met us out in public, the first time likely would have been at VMworld 2009 and that's where we had more or less the, the real grand opening of the, of the company. And so Stratosphere is that solution that can provide monitoring and diagnostics and you see it called Stratosphere UX for user experience and, th and that solution uh, was an acquisition that David and the original founders made from a company called VMSite. It was based here in Alpharetta, Georgia, and it was the genesis for Stratosphere, and it is a very mature product set, and uh, literally thousands of organizations have relied on that solution, and as we make that solution more and more mature, uh, we'd like to tell you what's new in that, in that. We have some as we said, customers on the phone. We have some partners on the phone and some people that perhaps maybe never heard about us. David, did I do that justice on how the company got started real quick and bring that into Stratosphere? Yeah, you did, you did great. You did great. I really appreciate that um, entryway. And, you know, uh, when we set out there, you know, one of the things we really did was we created those two fit and UX scores, you know, that really helped you identify the types of workloads that you had. And that helped you identify that user experience and, and roll them up into that composite metric. So we are pioneers of that. You know, we deliver workspace transparency. Uh, it's for the operations team and multi different teams of support. Uh, as you said, assessments and spot checks lately have become big. Um, user centric, application centric, and uh, daily trending and five minute drill downs. And so, yeah, that's uh, 
That's the Stratosphere product in a nutshell. Yeah, David, Great. people ask me all the time what, what the difference is between fit and UX, and I have to explain to them, and I have to use the word fit many times. Is the user, is the machine a good fit? So I love that that name was selected that long ago, and it's still in play, you know, even moving from on-prem to cloud, still, is it a good fit? Still works very nice. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. That was an uh, accidental insight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I talked about the view it gives you of infrastructure and, and you know what could have somewhat been predict predicted in 2009 was that we weren't going to be talking about VDI being hosted locally in a data center but it was you know the, we were already coming up cloud in, in that time and now Stratosphere is more pertinent than ever in this new transformation to new desktop platforms that are hosted on any of the three major clouds Amazon, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure, and we are the only desktop monitoring user experience solution that's available in those marketplaces. If you go check them right now, you'll see Stratosphere listed. You will not see any other monitoring solution uh, that is listed on all three. At best, you'll see anybody listed on one of those. So we are multi-cloud, we are multi-desktop, and you can also use us, and I mentioned this in virtual desktops, but we are used widely on physical desktops and virtual desktops and cloud. That's because Stratosphere monitors Windows infrastructure. So if you're ready uh, to think about what the next desktop is going to be, you might perform an assessment. And if you're starting to have these hybrid types of environments, maybe you're uh, burst scaling into VDI or into a cloud service like Amazon Workspaces, we're there to help you do that too because we can monitor those desktops, make sure those SLAs are being met, those service agreements. You know, are you getting the desktop that you were promised? Well, and Jason, and you know, I would like to add there, uh, not only are we monitoring everything in Windows, but we can also monitor Mac. So if you've got Macs in your environment, we can tell you what's going on there. We can monitor Linux, uh, and we have custom clients for three of the major thin client vendors out there. So not only are we able to get in and see what's going on in your virtual desktops and what's going on in your physical Windows desktops, we can look at what's going on in your endpoints to those virtual desktops. We can look at what's going on to thin clients that are reaching into the cloud and give you a 360 degree view. And, you know, like David said, give you real transparency into what's happening on the platforms you're on and maybe the platforms you're thinking about going to. Indeed, that was, a, that was better stated than even I had, had, had put it. Um, we want to look at what's what's new lately. So let's let's think about when the last releases of Stratosphere were. Again, we'd love questions. You know, if if you've got anything uh, about any question about what we've we've talked about so far, put those in the chat window. We'd love to go the direction of questions more than what we want to talk about even. So so type those right in and let us know what you're thinking or what you want to hear from. Now I'll recap. Uh, we shipped uh, Stratosphere version 6.1.5 in June of this year, and it had uh, official support for new clients and platforms, including more thin clients. We had support for um, already for iGel and for Stratodesk. Uh, this added also support for 10Zig Linux clients. We uh, were in the Amazon marketplace with hourly billing. We were already in there before, but now even with hourly billing, and that's of use, especially when we're seeing work from home. If people say, we, we just need to use these desktops when we need to use them and, and be billed for them when we need to be billed for them. And that's their agreement with Amazon, and we sync right up with that if that's what they want to do. So we have licenses that can be, uh, that can be allocated by the hour even, or, or charged by the hour. And then we had uh, Microsoft Azure appliance deployment, and that was to be able to uh, de deploy the Stratosphere uh, appliance directly on Azure. And we had process optimization updates. Now, this is a feature that was introduced over a year ago, process optimization. In this case, Stratosphere gives you metrics, decision support on what you should do based on the performance of your environment. But in this case, our Stratosphere optimizer feature that was added over a year ago, uh, it actually optimizes the resources on individual desktops, and that could be cloud or virtual desktops as well. What's allocated there, any any application that's in the forefront will, will tune and give more in real time um, resources to it, RAM, CPU, anything that's in the back, ground we can deprioritize and in that way you get you can get even an additional year or more out of your hardware even when you're hosting it on servers and VDI but on physical desktops you can prolong the life of your hardware because you'll get a boost in performance right away when you use this feature in June 
we added process optimization reports. So we're telling you exactly how we're tuning those. So that was something interesting that we did in, in June. And then we had uh, dashboard enhancements. We call these dashboards where you're getting the reports from. And we had inspector updates as well, where uh, we were looking at RDP and RFX uh, protocol latency, and we had speed enhancements in there when looking at those. And then we added a spot checks uh, tab with more metrics for speed and, and had a, 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 a UI update in that area. Uh, in addition to that, we had security updates and, and bug fixes. So that's what we shipped in June. In a little bit, we can talk about what we're about to uh, announce here shortly. But Chris? Yep. Uh, those, um, the optimization technology, and David knows more about this than I do, but uh, uh, the optimization technology was always tracking your foreground application so they could raise it. But now we're actually able to look at and use that in Stratosphere 615 and above where I can use it for work from home and productivity. So now with that technology, I can tell and monitor, okay, uh, Michael Torian has spent, you know, eight hours on his machine and Google Chrome was up and running. Oh, by the way, and that was a foreground application. Excel, Word, all that stuff were in the background. So I can tell which application he was actually looking at. So a lot of customers are looking at that from a pro productivity standpoint, but it was kind of a side effect, David, correct me if I'm wrong, of the optimizer technology. We just mined it for another use. Yeah, exactly. We um, we uh, basically took a look at the uh, screen that you were in, and we recorded the time for that, and and uh, we were doing that anyway, so we passed it right along, and now we can account for how much time you spend on which apps. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So productivity has come in very handy in some of our customers. Ray, yeah, I think so we've got a question. Joseph, Joseph just uh, chimed in more of a comment than anything else. Um, so I won't unmute him just for this, but he said, not a question, but just wanted to mention that we have used optimization specifically for Cisco Jabber as our entire call center runs on VDI. It has made a big difference in our end user experience. So yeah, there's some Jabber real process. feedback there. Yeah. yeah, if it gets slowed down at all by the machine being overrun, um, it can cause a lot of audio problems. Along with that, Stratosphere can watch the latency of Jabber and what it's talking to. So jitter is really a big thing to watch for that. Um, you know, I was training a, a new partner just yesterday and you know, thousands of metrics in Stratosphere, but today I may need to know what the charge level is on your battery, how hot is your CPU, and tomorrow it's all around the data store latency. And we have it really end to end to, to help people uh, do that stuff. But Jabber and call voice over IP systems has been huge this year. Yep. Well, and that ties into what Jason was, was saying earlier, Chris, about, you know, uh, uh, Joseph just talked about using that with Jabber in, in VDI, but we've been seeing it with people using Teams mm -hmm. on their on their physical devices um, yep. and being able to, to you know, to, to trace latency and jitter and even hairpinning between, uh, between Teams calls and, and Zoom calls that people are doing now that they're working from home. And that's the exact same technology he's talking about in VDI. Yeah, it's really cool. Jack Smith, one of our SEs up in Chicago, he's big into, you know, the office products and what's going on in Microsoft Office. He built a dashboard and we were in the proof of concept for this customer. And he was actually able to watch in the dashboard as Office 365 was going down three weeks ago. He knew about it before Microsoft announced it. It actually showed up right there on the dashboard. David, have you seen Jack's dashboard? It's on the community guess, side. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And the customer was able to, or the, you know, the pre-customer, they haven't purchased yet, but he was able to watch the front doors of Microsoft Office starting to get higher and higher latency before Microsoft even announced it. It was, it was awesome. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And that's one of the benefits of having, as uh, we alluded to earlier on, having the appliance on Azure, having it on all these different uh, platforms, uh, that you can get one source of understanding the latency or one source of the CPU. You don't have to worry about if that technology you're using has an API for you to get it, if this technology over here calculates it differently, if the technology over there is it using a different unit size and how you add all that up. Uh, because we're out there and we're in all these different environments deployed and supporting them, you have one spot to go for the API call or one spot to go for the source of truth, which is is nice. Yeah. Yeah, the source of truth. That's a good point. Um, it invariably customers that are running Stratosphere, you know, I run the Citrix environment, I run the Horizon environment, I run the Azure environment, but they rely on Active Directory. And I can't tell you how many times this year my 
my Citrus guys have called me and said, hey, can you get on the phone to me and explain to my networking guys these metrics and stratosphere? I need, I, I can't be the bad guy. Will you be the bad guy for me? So, that, right. you know, or There's active lot directory lot issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so they'll get me on there and say, you know, I can't talk, you know, even though the Citrus guy understands it and he knows stratosphere data, he's like, they they report to a different boss and I have no pull with them. Will you come on the phone and be the bad guy? Sure. Well, that's that's uh, the sure. problem with adding a tool that's just for one specific department or one specific you know set of, of administrators and none of the other administrators have access to that and you've got to put a ticket in or a call in to figure out yep. they don't want you into that tool. That's the beauty of Stratosphere. <laughs> they can go across the whole organization like that and let everybody participate, right? Yep. Yeah. And you can't hire it. Um, I think Tom Miller calls it the the uh, truth detector. You know, at the end of the day, you can't hide from those numbers. Um, you know, mm-hmm. if you know, if I'm losing packets on this particular segment to this particular um, building, quality of service is not turned on. You know, as much as you want to tell me it is, networking guys, here's the data right here. I'm losing packets. If you have quality of service turned on, I should not be losing packets. Then they'll go away, and then all of a sudden, I stop losing packets. What did you change? Nothing. Right? Okay. Yeah. I don't care. As long as it's fixed, I don't care. So, yeah, I get how many, how many times uh, nothing's changed in an environment, um, uh, but all of a sudden things just start working again. So, yep. Right. It looks like we have some more questions. Yeah, we have some more questions, and I'm going to kind of uh, – I might not take them necessarily in order. We'll get them all through here. But I know we were talking a lot about different, um, you know, data and all this stuff coming in. And Todd asks, how many data points on performance and usage does Liquidware collect or report on per endpoint? Do we even know what that number is? <laughs> I don't. Depends on how many how many things you turn on in the SID configuration, right? But it's a pretty high number. It's a pretty high number. I, I don't I'm trying to remember what the last numbers were. I thought they were somebody had said some numbers and I was just like, well, that's crazy. I don't think we have that many. But um Might have been me. Know, I mean there's over three hundred solid core metrics. I know that for sure. And that number's probably low. I probably have some people laughing at right now on a SE team, but I would say there's at least a few hundred solid metrics in there yeah but you're just talking about the SID we also do virtual center we do Acropolis right we got network sniffers stations yep. so that's just the SID yep. Yep. there's all kinds of login breakdown data that comes in that's um, not actually rolled out in a separate columns it comes over in like kind of like a paragraph form like an x-ray machine so you can look down and see all the events that were flying by during login and all the uh, so those are obviously many different metrics there and different things that are flying by in a, in a digest form and like a uh, log form. So, yep. People are amazed at how much data we store in our database. Um, it's compressed, uh, first of all. So the data is compressed. But yeah, and they ask me, okay, I need to store 10,000 machines. How, you know, how big is the database? And they're expecting me to say 10 terabytes. Um, but we're actually very efficient with our with our data storage. That's another benefit of having one tool that can go over the infrastructure and start to record and, and store the data about the user experience. And if you had to use that each individual tool to store that and they all stored it in different ways and you're not sure yep. how they're storing it, then you're uh, it, you know you're using a lot more resources there. Now you can set those audit logs to you know to a smaller uh, uh, and let the retention logs be smaller on the other products. And Stratosphere can do a daily roll-up of everything for you uh, for a long-term storage. So yeah, the numbers are, using, the roll-up numbers are great. Yeah, the, the database we're using, CentOS or CentOS, is I've heard it called both things. But uh, Postgres. Postgres we're, yeah. And Postgres. But we're, we're doing some upgrades for that for the next version that's, that's about to be announced. Uh, speed enhancements. And we're not going to tie anything to a – to a specific performance increase, but we're looking for even better performance in the upcoming 6.5, which should be within days you'll know about. Well, it I, I could tell you, I'm putting my neck on the line a little bit, but we had about um, about 100% performance improve, 50%, how do you count that? Half the, half the speed, uh, half the time it took, rather, to um, pull uh, the same type of queries off of the two primary data sources, which would be the summary inspector, it's called, it's the user machine main inspector, and then the applications inspector, which is a super heavy processes are like Teams is opening tons of processes in five minutes. I mean, just tons of them, tons of PIDs. You have no idea. So um, so those two inspectors are usually the most uh, used and they may be the most sluggish. And so they've been optimized first half the time to run queries in this this version. And we'll continue to go through the other inspectors, uh, subsequent versions. Yeah, that's just the API. We also got moving from CentOS 6 to CentOS 8. 
um, Postgres SQL 8 to version 12. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, I'm hoping to push that, push that bar pretty high there. So. I, I, I see a question here from Brad Bradford. Um, it, it was with a federal customer. It's regarding Profile Unity. Bradford, we'll, we'll get back to you on your question about that. He's talking about when it runs and, you know, how they have extra security and all that and uh, asking about roadmap. But we'll follow up with you on email uh, for that one, Bradford. Yeah. He also yeah, had a question Bradford. about um, authorization attempt in Stratosphere, which I think is maybe a little different. Is that what you're referring to, Jason? Or is no, that there was another, another one question? Yeah. Yeah. But the, the auth, auth uh, attempt, he said, is there any way to view more data on that area in, in Stratosphere? Go will to the vent log. So they, I mean, so somebody trying, I assume he's talking about somebody tries to log into a machine, but is denied, that would show up in a, an event log. And or the auth attempt in the login breakdown metric, which is how long it takes for the domain controller to respond, I believe, and how many yeah. times you've attempted it. We we have, um, if you, uh, when you go to log in, there's a request credentials that's popped up um, from the login breakdown. And that's when you get on your screen, type in your user and password, that's the request credentials. Once you put that password in there, which injects automatically if you're using like, you know, web interface to a virtual desktop or something. But uh, once that screen goes away, and authenticates with domain controller and you're allowed in the system, that's your auth attempt. And there's a time uh, the domain controller answers back and it, it fulfills that request. And that's usually a very short amount of time. When it gets longer, you probably want to know why is it longer? What's happened there? Um, so anyway, if that happens more than once, if they put in the bad password, that never happens through an auto inject, but if they put a bad password in, then it'll go for another auth attempt. So have two auth attempts. You could have a count of auth attempts and then you could also have times on the auth attempts. And there's no other further detail underneath that really, other than looking at the other events that happened in the login breakdown pre and post at this point. Um, so that's not like a security question. Yeah, like a probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Likely, since it's uh, a federal account. The um, in this upcoming version, so we're within days about announcing version 6.5 and. Just a side note, if you're wondering why we keep the versions staggered so shortly with dot this and dot that, we have to go through far more certifications for um, the federal business that we do and others. And that's why we, you don't see big leaps with us to 7.0 or 8.0. It, uh, it matters about getting recertified and things like that. That's the short answer. Because um, I, I often wondered that myself. So it doesn't have anything to do with the significant news in each release. We have 6.5 coming out 6.1.5 I just uh, talked about in in June uh, but this one is coming out uh, within days you'll hear more about it um, we already mentioned this the the speed enhancements on the queries um, we have uh, API builder version 2 is GA now um, and I know this is something close to David's heart it's uh, it's got a GUI that's beautiful to look at David do you want to add anything to that yeah, sure. It allows um, any level or many level persons or engineers, um, even non-engineer, to create an API to pull data, to extract data from Stratosphere. And so again, today you may have to go to different systems. You may go to Azure Monitor. You may go to Citrix Analytics. Uh, you might go to VMware vRealize, uh, Nutanix Prism, and you're pulling in this information for maybe an operations team or you want to put it in service now. Somebody doesn't have an API there. Some APIs are complex to use and, and you have to walk the tree and understand how they work. And I'm not a hardcore developer myself and, and so I can use this. And so it's a graphical representation of the different inspectors. Uh, and then you can select with just clicking some buttons if you want Wi-Fi metrics or what metrics you want and the table fills out beneath. And you say, wow, that's exactly the data I wanna pull over to ServiceNow or whatever the application is. Uh, Power BI. And so then at that point, there's the JSON and the URL right up on the screen for you. All the stuff that you clicked and it created this beautiful table, it's right up in the screen. And you copy that and you send it over to your developer. And then he can execute that API over and over again recurringly to get the data out. So it's a real simple way for any level technical person to extract data from Stratosphere. Um, and it just, it, it, it up levels all the individuals to be able to get the data out um, for the operations team, again, from one source of truth. So pretty neat uh, addition to this last uh, release. Well, and Chris Walker. Quick, oh, there's a quick look at it as well. I put a screen up, I believe you should be able to see it. 
You can save your favorite query on the left hand side. Uh, you can send a query to somebody and they can import it and it goes, um, you can save that as a favorite as well on the left hand side. You could actually each under the columns tab, there's all the different tables that are in the inspectors under the columns tab. And so you can actually go to the columns tab and click default on every si single inspector and save it as inspector summary, inspector machines, inspector applications. On the left hand side, you can have a whole list of inspectors and um, you click and drill through the data just like you are in an inspector. So it's really neat uh, uh, API builder, kind of a preview as to some of the areas that our UIs are going towards. And, uh, and that API builder is built with the API. So what it, what it does is when it hits our API, it reads all the inspectors available. It also asks the API for all the columns available. It also asks the API for all the tooltip help for the columns. And um, that's all digested from the system when it opens up. So when we put a new metric in, we don't recode anything in the API builder. You just open up the API builder and it just sees that new metric automatically. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, years ago, when I first started here, almost nine years now, um, or eight, I lose count. But uh, when I first started, I was actually writing, uh, writing reports in the BERT report writer, working with DK, and we had to do you know, full-blown SQL calls as soon as the API builder came out, I was able to do ad hoc reports for my customers on the fly. I want to know how many times Michael Torian logged in, ran Microsoft Excel, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, um, but ignore lunchtime. You can't do a report like that. I mean, that's just a pain in the butt. But guess what? You can do it in the API builder. And that gave them the flexibility to basically, I mean, I can, I can build an API on my system, on my demo system. The customer says, I need this data. No problem. Five minutes. Click, 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 click. Send them back the URL, say, put in your hub name here, and they just click on it and run. It saved me a huge, massive amount of time for ad hoc reports, ad hoc exports. Yeah, the API builder has been a, a godsend getting data. And it amazes me how many of our competitors don't even have an API. It's crazy. I, I don't understand it. Well, one of the things David mentioned, Chris, and I know that you've been working on is, is, is taking that data and, and pulling that into your ticketing systems. Yeah. So, you know, not not only are you able to go in as an administrator and create a, a report that shows you exactly what you want, you're able to have that pulled in so that your frontline support people can know how many times Excel was open or know what type of Wi-Fi metrics the user that's calling in for support has. Um, I mean, I think that's really one of the biggest things that, that we've got going. And I mean, you've got a couple of customers that are that are now starting to push the, the boundaries with that tech. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've always wanted it, and we've used the API in the past to hook into Remedy or heat ticketing systems or things like that, but we've actually finally built a, you know, a true integration kit for ServiceNow, but Power BI is also extremely. I got a customer, um, me and um, um, we've got uh, this large customer, 30,000 machines, but they're moving from Horizon to Citrix or vice versa. And they're using Stratosphere to understand the translation, how many people are moving over, what is their user experience, and they're doing all of this stuff in Power BI, pulling from multiple Stratosphere systems. And don't, and don't forget, Power BI. Go ahead. when you use that Power BI system there, you're using it with the web API call directly. Yeah. You're not using yep. some kind of special you know, yep. kit that's now SQL command and... Yep. No, so this is, you're going into Power BI, you're saying you want to add a new data source, it's a web data source, and you're pasting in a URL, and yep. you're done. The data's yep. in. So it's, it's yep. pretty cool. Beautiful, beautiful sure. reports for executive management. Um, yeah, so they can actually see the business running. There's several um, um, templates of Power BI on the community site. So please, and everybody go. that like a Power BI online as well, even if your Stratosphere yep. box is behind the data center, because it's your web client that's communicating with Power BI, and then your your web clients communicating with your database here. It, it, it's really nice, really nice system the way that that works. And so um, Tableau's got the same thing. You know, I got some customers running Tableau. We had a big customer, um, I think, up in the Northeast. It's running Tableau, and they're pulling all the data out of Stratosphere, and it's interfaced into a Tableau because that's what the company uses. Like you know, at the end of the day, our Stratosphere interface is designed for engineers. We do have a pretty nice dashboarding system. But if my CEO is already in Tableau, already in Power BI, already in ServiceNow, I don't want him to have to go to another interface. That's just a pain. You know, he's got another login ID, another website to go to. So let's integrate that data together. And I'm talking to a lot of customers where, look, I've got A product, B product, C product, D product, 
and you know they do each one of these things and then look at stratosphere it does all that stuff yeah and then you you know, so you got less integration points so if i need that data from you know my login breakdown and i need remote display data and i need my vmware infrastructure guess what it's all in stratosphere that's three or four different products that i've just eliminated with stratosphere and made your integration point to your ticketing system whatever it is much simpler mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. cheaper sometimes cheaper well, to, uh, and to your point I also want to mention that we uh, you'll hear more about this as we run as we go along, but our integration with ServiceNow, which wasn't right now through our API, but it was through uh, an efficient plugin that uh, has been developed with a ServiceNow partner. Chris Walker was uh, key in that, and so you'll hear more about that from us, but that is also piping the data into where your help desk support may want to and need to see it to, to really remedy issues on the desktop. So you've seen us expand our compatibility for um, for service ticketing and, and other systems there. Chris, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, the value proposition, whether it's ServiceNow or Heat or Remedy or Zendesk, the, the value proposition of taking that data that's in Stratosphere about Michael Torian's Wi-Fi adapter at his house and pulling that into a ticket so that that um, – that guy on the ticketing system can actually resolve the problem. Not to, don't just tell him just to reboot. Oh, well, yeah, it got better. Okay, I'm closing the ticket. No, let's actually find out what the problem is. Hey, you're running five gigahertz. I can tell that you're you're jumping back and forth between two and four gigahertz. Let's lock you to 2.4 and just go ahead and fix the problem. So I was on a webinar the other day with a partner, and the um, their marketing guy brought up a really good point. And I've never heard anybody say this. He said, how many tickets are the ticketing people actually solving, whether well, just mitigating? How many times did they think they solved a problem just by rebooting the machine when in actuality all they did was mitigate it? They closed mm -hmm. all the applications, rebooted the OS, but at reality, the guy's running out of memory. His hard drive's too slow. He's got a Wi-Fi problem. So with that data now in your ticketing system – they can actually resolve the issue and then flip it upside down with Stratosphere and say, hey, this guy has a problem. He has this model HP with this model driver. We have 5,000 other people with exactly the problem. Let me kick off a ticket to the, t to the desktop team to actually go resolve it for everybody else before they call me. Yeah, no, it's great. You can see uh, what's the build OS that everybody's on. Depend doesn't matter on the platform. Well, this platform, we use this to monitor. We can't tell that. This platform, we use something else to monitor. We don't know this. No, that's not how it is with Stratosphere, right? We know the OS build, the operating system type, the application version, the command line argument. It doesn't matter if it's for Linux, if it's for Windows, if it's for Mac, if it's on Horizon, if it's on Citrix, if it's coming over on Nutanix Frame, if we're doing WVD, it doesn't matter. And then that's one source for the API that anybody can use, remember, with the API builder. And then you've got that source of truth with the same type of unit. You don't have to know if it was a five-minute collection or if it needs to be averaged over some kind of time frame. It's crazy when you try to take all this data from all these different systems and pull it together into uh, you know, some, some factual uh, knowledge that you need to base another decision on. So uh, Stratosphere really can be a lifesaver and, and, and bring all those teams together for sure. We had a question about the correlation of, of Stratosphere data. Do you think the uh, the updates that we're going to see in 6.5, David, that's going to make that even quicker? The uh, what the correlation of the data? The, way, the specific question, is there a way to pull the info into Stratosphere to make for quicker correlation? Oh, they want to bring in other data points. Ah, uh, bring in other data points, yeah. Maybe it was based on his previous question. Brad, if you want to let me know. I yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm thinking, I hate to say no, I don't like to say no, I'm thinking no in this case, uh, but, you know, if I was to understand the question correctly, but, uh, but it is um, pretty easy to pull data out of Stratosphere to get it into something else that you may also have some data into, and then you can look at it all together. Um, so, um, I could definitely drill down on that, though, some more. Uh, well, I think it was in reference to his auth attempts question that he had. Based that we addressed the, earlier. Well, it says yeah. based on, he just entered based on the previous question to correlate with the domain controller to, it got cut off. Yeah, well, there is um, a number of things now that we just added to login breakdown. There's also the uh, current level of CPU load on the machine, the current memory and the IOPS on the machine. And then there's the actual processes on the 
during the login time right at that moment. So for every second, the whole machine stats are written now, CPU memory disk IO. And then also for every second of the login, all the processes that pop up, if there is one that we see pop up, we're gonna put that CPU memory disk IO uh, also going down the login timeline. So those two additional pieces of information, if you had an auth attempt issue and there was a long delay on an auth attempt issue, and you had a huge amount of network IO occurring on the machine, and then a couple processes right above you saw were responsible for that network IO. Maybe you could draw and infer that you have some network issue right now because all your bandwidth is being taken up, and you can see that that just kicked off a second beforehand. So there are some additional pieces that are tied into the login process right now that could help you correlate some more of what's happening right around a certain event or a certain process. That's brand new, and and. I think it's uh, highly valuable, even if it's not hitting the market uh, of the original question. But all right, I had a question from Mohammed, um, who was we were looking at. Uh, he, he specifically wanted to see the differences between the releases, and you know, he's he's got 6.1.5 right now. So I'll give you a look at that graphically here, and uh, I don't have a lot of the detail, but we can verbally add it to the and conversation. What I, just, what I just mentioned isn't 6.1.5, by the way. So with the log breakdown stuff there, but. Here is six, I don't know how much of my screen is getting hidden. Ray, can you tell me? Is there? Back to you. You're, we it's it. Just to go to meet and stuff on top, I couldn't tell. The 6.1.5 uh, release was here, and I went through that verbally earlier in the webinar. You know, uh, official support for new clients, we talked about, we talked about the process optimization updates and reports, we talked about dashboard en enhancements. Um, advanced inspector updates and spot checks tab and and then you've got we always almost always have security updates and, and bug fixes of course because the quality of the software just gets better and better well hold on hold on back up back up yeah one of the biggest one of the biggest ones in 615 to me was Wi-Fi statistics mm -hmm. as well as trace route which you don't even list on here the trace mm -hmm. route got a got a big upgrade and actually do a reverse DNS lookup so I can actually see who your external provider is very powerful and the Wi-Fi statistics in 615, um, as well as work from home or work from home, what applications are in the foreground, uh, upgrades to optimizer. So 615 was a pretty big release in June. So just to kind of add some detail around no, that. That's good. That's good. I didn't mean to breeze past it, but he's on 615, so you're reminding him of what he has, which is good. Yep. Um, here is at a it's, it's a little higher level overview. I don't have sub bullets in here yet. We'll talk about we're doing a what's new webinar next month, by the way. Um, for all of our solution sets. So you want to make sure that you register for that and you can do that on our website. But anyway, this is 6.5 and we're look, you're, we're days out within announcing this. You'll be able to download it soon, right, David, is the plan? Yeah, it's done and ready to go. I think they're just getting it up on the web, checking all the SHA, this is and that's, making sure that uh, AWS and Azure and GCP and all those can mm -hmm. accept the appliance. I went through these um, verbally uh, I didn't bring the slide up, but I talked about the database upgrades here. We talked about the API. I showed a screenshot of that. If we want to move into this area, Chris Walker, if you want to address any of these in this area. Actually, David um, probably goes okay. through those better. There's a well, long the list. Of performance is, is great, uh, and that also does not in infect inspectors uh, 0 and 1, which is the summary inspector user machine, and then it's the apps inspector. So that will also benefit from bullet 3. Um, and then the spot checks will benefit from bullet three as well. The dashboards will benefit from bullet three because those all use the API actually. Um, and more and more uses the API as we go forward. Um, and then the API builder G2, V2, that's the, that's actually uh, its current day 1.0 debut um, where you can save your APIs. That's just amazing. You can start an API, you can get going, you could have to go do something else. You can come back and you don't have to start over. It's saved, you can continue on, you can share it with a coworker, put it as a favorite. It's really, really cool. Um, and then um, as far as the machine health goes, you know, there you're looking at things like, is your firewall turned on? Uh, when is your last Windows update? How many Windows updates do you still have pending? That's really, really great. I mean, to know that there's a bunch of physical machines out there that have Windows updates that haven't been applied, that need to be applied, um, and you're having some kind of a problem and you don't know why there's a problem and the user thinks that they're rebooting the machine, but they're not, they're sleeping it and they're resuming it all the time and they're not getting those updates installed. I mean, so this is really gonna help uh, see through a lot of that and understand. Uh, of course, we know last boot, official boot time and stuff too, but the updates are really great there. Um, the firewall again, is the firewall on or off? There's even what AV provider do you have 
uh, right now and spyware provider. Uh, those two metrics aren't showed right now through the API and shown through the um, UI, but the spyware and the antivirus providers, those are shown in a set of reports. There's a set of reports that go deep on machine health uh, right now. So. A lot of those stats are so, very Tim, helpful for work from home, as Chris and I were talking about them earlier this week, right? Um, knowing that about these endpoint devices, that first mile of connectivity, because you you may be charged this year with having to support a bunch of machines you never had to support before, B, BYO, uh, bring your own device, uh, or maybe the kid's laptop <laughs> that has a Citrix icon on it so they can launch their session, but you still need to know about that end device. If you're monitoring it with Stratosphere, a lot of those new metrics matter. Uh, on the AV and, th and things like that on it. So, so I got a question here. Uh -huh. um, Tim chimed in and he asked, I see machine health on there and some of the different metrics, but do you have any information about battery? Yes, battery charge. And uh, David, um, one of the first questions when I showed a customer the battery charge capabilities was, can you tell me how many times it's gone through a charge cycle because that's how the manufacturers do their warranty and tell you when it needs to be replaced. Yeah, and so so we don't really count them all up for you, but you can kind of tell right now if you go look at it, but you can't really get the total count on there because there's also an API probably to read from the batteries, kind of like metadata. There's, I'm sure there's some kind of like metadata there um, and we don't do that. So, but we are telling you when it's charging and when it's not charging. And so you can look and see uh, it's currently in the unplugged or in the plugged state, I believe, by it says charging active or not or something like that on that metric. So um, so I, at this point, uh, we give you the battery, though, percentage, which is really cool. And um, you'll know if it's been charging or not. So, yeah, David and I were watching one of our engineers the other day. The guy, he's got a MacBook. So this does work across Windows, Linux, Mac, doesn't matter. Um, he was down in Texas and we were actually watching his battery go up. You know, his battery was draining. And then we went and looked at the CPU temperature. Right. The CPU right. temperature went up. Remember that? The CPU temperature mm -hmm. went up. And then we could tell it his battery was coming back up. So while it's charging, yep. the CPU got hot because it was charging yep. the battery. Yep. I remember Not that. Not because he was using it. I mean, but it was really interesting. And then we were even we were able to see his Wi-Fi statistics and tell that he was not in his office because his distance from his, his network. So all that stuff, we were actually able to almost follow him around the house. <laughs> Little big brothers there, but I mean, you could tell a lot about the user habits. Yeah, no, that's so cool. So that that is in there. Um, and then there's a CPU fan. Uh, there's fan speeds that got in there, but there's so many fans in some of these boxes, and then some other boxes don't have fans. So we 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 try. They don't believe it or not. Some of these boxes have some type of machine fan, not a CPU fan, and it's not called that anymore so uh, but we'll be coming out with in the next release uh, some kind of fan moniker name so you can tell chassis fan CPU fan and it's just to help some of this stuff with uh, work from home and a lot of people are inundated now with these types of things they, they weren't inundated with before when they were in a virtual desktop um, and so we've, we've been adding those in quickly to, to yeah. react to the market so um, got a comment about uh... Uh, from Tony saying he had to jump, but he loved the format, and he's going to be back to another unplug soon. Um, right. I want to I want to talk about uh, how these audience members that may not have had experience with uh, Stratosphere, whether they are uh, potential customers or, or partners, um, how they can learn more. It's very easy to evaluate Stratosphere, and you can be doing it within the hour, literally, or, or even in the half hour. You can go over to our download page on liquidware.com and you can uh, download it. A trial license is included and it's not limited in any way of functionality. So you get a you get the full drink there and, and get to see how it can assess for new desktops or troubleshoot with you the full user experience reports that we're talking about today. The way that we typically can engage with you to give you a little bit uh, uh, more guidance, if there's something specific you're looking for, these talented individuals we've got right here on this, Michael Torian, Chris Walker, are the are the typical people that would uh, get on a call with you and find out what you're trying to do, what what problem are you trying to solve, and they can talk to you. And in Stratosphere, here's the thing, it knows more about the desktop and performance than anything else out there. And, and finding the right report in there can and at, at times be the challenge. But when you get one of our SEs on there really quickly, they'll drill down to it, show you exactly where that is. If you need any uh, brief training to get started beyond 
and I don't think you'll, you will, but if you need anything like that, you'll have them uh, there with you. You can schedule a call with them, and then the territory manager that can make sure that uh, your needs are being met will be in touch with you too to try to set something up. Um, and uh, we're, we're licensed uh, any way you want to license us, right? Any, anything from a uh, perpetual license with maintenance to subscription-based licenses, and I mentioned even hourly licenses. So we're very flexible in that area. Our partners uh, are very great at helping us uh, implement our solutions and also solve the needs of our co joint customers. And they are there to help, help you with your overall project as well, and we can help put you in touch with a, uh, a partner there. You see the resources on this page, the uh, the website, the community, the email. And with all that said, I want to see if there's anything outstanding. There's some questions that we, we'll just simply get to and, and follow up with you. But uh, Ray? Yeah, there's a, maybe at least one more that we can squeeze in and anybody else um, will try to follow up with you. Or if you have additional questions beyond this, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Unplugged uh, at liquidware.com to ask your questions. And we'll make sure that they get routed to the right person to ask them. But uh, David had asked, uh, he's updating uh, Terra 2.0 clients to thin clients for my at-home users. We are not putting a VPN client down. Can these devices report back? They haven't checked the site to see, so he thought he'd just ask. What? Uh, what? It Go said ahead. zero clients, so I'm not sure on the zero clients. So we're gonna double confirm because zero might mean that we're not able to put anything on it like an agent. We can still get RDP information or ICA information or different things like that that come through. We can still get certain types of latencies and certain types of packet loss if that provider of that remote display protocol delivers those to us and then we're getting them from them. But if it's a zero client, we can't put an endpoint agent on it, which is our magic, then we may be limited to get different types of trace routes and external IPs and different things that we get by being on the endpoint, 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 the first mile metrics that we call them. So uh, if it's a, a true zero client, we should double confirm the models and makes and stuff. If it's a Linux-based operating system on there, which I don't think it is, then a lot of times our agents will work on there. Uh, but zero means zero, so I, I think no. It's called well, but I think he's going. I think he said he's updating zero clients to oh. thin clients. Ah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it depends on which ones. Igel, Tenzig, Zerto. Um, if it's a small Linux client, like some of the HP boxes run a small Linux kernel. Um, but the trick there is, and I've been here eight or nine years. Up until February, I deployed one Stratosphere system into the DMZ. So these thin clients that don't have a VPN, they need to talk through the internet to the DMZ in what we call a collector. So yes, reach out to your field. He's, he, he's switching to thin HP thin pro. So oh. um, probably yeah, he actually asked an email and, to Jack Smith earlier. Um, I, I'm on that email train. Yeah. Yeah, I think yep. so. And, and with the way our product works, you can do that securely which is nice yep. because it's sending them through 443 to a collector in the DMZ. There's a secure method to accept that, not to have to bust in mm -hmm. the so I've, I've, the, I've, seen the, I've seen the Linux client loaded on the HP Thin Pros at one of my customers as well. Oh, cool. Good. Cool. Yep. So we've yep. got the, one the, 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 yep, the Linux one, then we've got custom ones with uh, iGel and Stratodesk and Tenzig. Mm -hmm. um, so we cover almost the gamut there with the Linux one that will will support uh, probably your use case. Can I share real quick? Sure. Right, the sharing button. Let me share. I want to share. share I think it's starting. Screen. It's uh, there it's pulled the there other one go. away. There we go. I see it. All right. So I actually worked with Ray on this configuration on this picture. Um, so basically those thin clients, they're going to want to come and report to what we call a collector, which is in your DMZ, your demilitarized zone, and then that collector will then push data back into directly into the Stratosphere database. So this is a, a special configuration that you want to get with your, um, your field SE or our professional services to, um, to actually implement. It's not simple, um, but yes, I've done it probably 10 times since February, um, so this is – because of all those thin clients out there, people are needing that the thin client doesn't have a VPN. Therefore, I need that thin client to be able to report, and it's got to go to the DMZ, and then the DMZ pushes it internal. But, yes, we can do that. Um, just need Much to reach better. out to your field SE to, to get that done. Todd is asking me where my drone is. I don't I need one. 
<laughs> All right, so um, we're at the, uh, we're more than top of the hour. Ray, if you wanna bring us home. Yeah, so we uh, we did record this session. We encourage you to check out community.liquidware.com. That's where we'll post the recording. Give us uh, 12, 24 hours, something like that. Check back tomorrow for a copy of that. If you have any more questions, that's a great place to ask them. Also, you can reach out to us uh, unplugged at liquidware.com. We can continue to answer your questions. There was a few questions that, that maybe didn't get uh, brought up here because we wanted to try to get everyone's in or at least one from everyone in. Um, so we'll try to follow up with everyone on all of these questions that uh, maybe didn't get addressed. So with that being said, thank you to Michael, Jason, David, and Chris for joining us today. It's a great session. Uh, as Jason mentioned, we've got a, a new what's new uh, session coming up, webinar session coming up. So watch for a link to that in your email boxes um, to register for that. That's coming up in December. And we'll have another unplugged session that you won't want to miss coming up in December. And we'll have more information on that coming up soon. So thank you all for uh, being with us today. And uh, we hope to see you again. Thank, yeah, you, thank you, everyone. You. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.